Hi, my name is Maurice Steen. I'm a psychiatrist at the University of California, San Diego, where I work in the medical school and the School of Public Health. And I'm also a staff psychiatrist at the VA San Diego healthcare system. I'm going to give you this brief introduction to post traumatic stress disorder on behalf of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium PTSD Workgroup. PTSD requires exposure to a traumatic event before it develops. The diagnostic criteria for PTSD, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, DSM 5, um, refers to the fact that exposure to the traumatic event can occur in, in various ways. So it, first of all, involves exposure to either an actual traumatic event or a threatened traumatic event. Uh, the person thought they might die, they thought they might be seriously injured or they were seriously injured, others around them might have been seriously injured or died. In particular, um, PTS, uh, the DSM-5 calls out sexual violation um, as being among the types of trauma that can yield PTSD. And the person can either have directly experienced the event, they could have been held up at gunpoint, they could have been raped, um, or they could have witnessed it. They might have seen somebody across the street being held up at gunpoint or getting raped or traumatized in some other serious life-changing way. Um, you could even learn that the traumatic event occurred to a close family member or a close friend, and that would be sort of a more vicarious way of developing um, uh, exposure to a traumatic event that could give you PTSD. And um, first responders, policemen and women, firemen and women, who are repeatedly exposed to these kinds of traumatic events are at increased risk for developing PTSD. Uh, we've touched already on what some of the trauma types are that can cause PTSD. So criminal victimization is uh, one of the most common sources of exposure to, that result in PTSD in the US. Um, rape and intimate partner violence, which affect predominantly women, but then also other kinds of assault. Severe motor, motor vehicle accidents, uh, where one person's injured, somebody might be killed. Childhood abuse, which um, could be itself the source of PTSD, but also can put individuals at risk for developing PTSD later on in life when they're re-traumatized. Those are the kinds of um, trauma that affect individuals. And then we have things that can affect larger groups of people. So natural disasters like serious earthquakes, um, hurricanes where there's lots of property damage and people are injured and people um, rightfully feared for their lives. And then terrorism in some countries, fortunately still not so much in the US, but, uh, but more in many other places. Um, and then war, which affects not just soldiers, but in many instances, civilians as well. After the exposure occurs, a subset of individuals, depending on uh, the type of trauma, the severity of the trauma, the duration of the trauma, will develop PTSD symptoms, either initially, um, and then many times they'll, they'll go away with time, but at other times they'll persist. And when they persist, uh, we refer to the individuals having PTSD, and they have the following symptoms. Um, there's four uh, sets or categories of symptoms that uh, an individual needs to have in order to meet diagnostic criteria for PTSD. Paramount among, among these are the re-experiencing or intrusive symptoms. Uh, here the individual doesn't want to be thinking about the trauma, but can't help themselves, has images, has memories um, flood their brains, flood their awareness, often associated with other physical symptoms that in some cases can even take the form of a flashback where they have difficulty discerning whether or not they're actually um, in the middle of the trauma um, and reliving it, or whether or not it's, it's something that they're imagining at the time. Um, symptoms like this can lead to avoidance, both of persons and places that remind the individual of the trauma, but also avoidance even of thoughts of the trauma uh, because of fear that they might um, trigger these, these uh, horrific symptoms. Lots of hyperarousal, trouble sleeping, um, being jumpy, uh, trouble with uh, being able to concentrate, being irritable and angry that goes along and then negative cognitions and mood. The person can uh, be depressed a lot of the time. They can have negative views of themselves in the world. 
they may have a lot of guilt, guilt about things they did, things they didn't do around the time of the trauma. And in order to have PTSD, the individual has to have some symptoms from each of these clusters. Prevalence of PTSD worldwide is somewhere around 3%, but there are uh, fairly big differences in different parts of the world, uh, in large part depending on what's going on in those uh, societies at the time. U.S. general population 12-month prevalence is around 3 to 4%, higher over a lifetime, around 7%. And women are about twice as likely as men in the U.S. to have PTSD. Um, even within the U.S., there are some big differences uh, that have to do with people's experiences. So U.S. military veterans, Vietnam, and, and probably many other wars, up to 30% of individuals might have PTSD. American Indians are living on reservations, uh, many of whom have been uh, exposed to high levels of um, poverty and uh, trauma and maltreatment, have very high rates of PTSD. And um, immigrants to the U.S. can carry with them the traumatic scars of um, exposure to um, life-threatening trauma. Um, for example, Cambodian refugees who've come to the U.S. even 20 years later have shown very, very high rates of PTSD. What do we know about risk for PTSD? Uh, we know actually a fair bit. Um, we know that women are at increased risk. Uh, individuals with low IQ or lower education are at increased risk. Characteristics of the individual's cognitions or beliefs at the time of the trauma. If somebody thought they were gonna die, they have a much higher risk of developing PTSD than people who had other thoughts. I mentioned already duration and severity of exposure to the trauma increases risk. Family history of anxiety or depression increases risk. And um, as we are um, studying in the PGC PTSD, um, we have uh, reason to believe that certain genes and probably many genes have uh, small effects that uh, in aggregate increase risk for PTSD after exposure to trauma. We are still uh, trying to understand as a field what the pathology is in PTSD, uh, but have made tremendous inroads into um, hypotheses and theories um, that are gaining increased evidence to back them up uh, that relate to the pathophysiology of PTSD. One of this is that there may be an increase in inflammation, both peripherally in the body, but possibly also in the brain, that there might be dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, uh, that there might be abnormalities in the way the body uh, handles glucocorticoids, substances such as cortisol and other stress hormones, um, differences in um, parts of the brain, both in terms of their structure and function, one of them being the hippocampus that's involved in the recording and retrieval of memories, and then a lot of work that's gone on through functional imaging studies looking at um, circuits that in um, humans mediate uh, responses to threat and understanding of threat and uh, is, is, can be referred to largely as fear circuitry. PTSD, like many of the other psychiatric disorders that are being studied by the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, um, doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's frequently seen along with other mental health problems. In the case of PTSD, major depression, substance abuse, uh, panic attacks, panic disorder, chronic pain, and a particular type of physical injury involving the brain, uh, traumatic brain injury. And it goes beyond just seeing these um, comorbid or co-occurring conditions cross-sectionally, but over time, we also see that individuals with PTSD are more prone to develop cardiovascular disease. They are um, also more prone over a long period of time to develop dementia and uh, also seem to be at risk for obesity, which um, may be part of the pathway from uh, PTSD to cardiovascular disease and possibly even relate to dementia. We have treatments for PTSD. Um, we would like to have better treatments in terms of medication treatments. We have two drugs, both selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRI, sertraline paroxidine that were approved over 20 years ago. Uh, many other drugs have been studied. Um, some have proven to be um, somewhat efficacious. 
And part of the problem we deal with is that there's probably no one medication that's right for everybody. And what one of the things we hope that comes out of the efforts of the PGC PTSD will be to help us better understand subsets of individuals who are more likely to respond to specific treatments. Right now, our best therapies are some of the psychotherapies, the evidence-based psychotherapies. Um, here's uh, four different types of therapy that have been shown to be efficacious. And um, in particular, prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy have been um, widely rolled out by the United States Veterans Administration, by the VA, and they've trained hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals to deliver these evidence-based treatments. The future of PTSD treatment is, um, is, is rosy. Um, we're at a point where the neurobiology of PTSD is, is um, um, sufficiently well understood, uh, largely because of this increase in understanding of the neuroscience of fear and its application to PTSD, but also because human genetics, uh, such as the work being done by the PGC PTSD and other groups, is yielding additional insights that we hope is going to lead to precision medicine possibilities where we're able to target the right treatment to the right individual with PTSD based on an understanding of their particular pathophysiology. We need new clinical trials um, in the US and also worldwide. Fortunately, the pharmaceutical industry has uh, become uh, reinvigorated in studying PTSD largely because of these advances that have been made in our understanding of the biology that's given um, the pharmaceutical companies new molecular targets um, to study in PTSD. So let me stop there and I thank you very much for your attention. Hi everyone, my name is Frank Wendt. I am a postdoctoral fellow with Renato Polamonti at Yale School of Medicine. Today we'll be talking about post-traumatic stress disorder and some of the historical studies that have led us from gene discovery to understanding some disease biology in relation to PTSD. I don't have any conflict of interest to disclose. So PTSD is ultimately uh, sort of the end product of a series of events, including pre-trauma risk factors and traumatic events. But in order for us to really understand what's going on with PTSD, we have to have some understanding of what's happening prior to di uh, diagnosis of PTSD, including those traumatic events and the pre-trauma risk factors. So uh, looking at PTSD in the DSM-5, I've listed here the uh, criteria that are used for diagnosis. Um, the description of each of those um, diagnostic criteria and some example qualifiers for each of those um, criteria. We see here some of our sort of uh, common themes that we think about with PTSD, including re-experiencing, hyperarousal, and avoidance symptoms. We also see some qualifiers in terms of the uh, length of time these disturbances are happening. This is required for uh, at least one month. And we also see some qualifiers here for um, what the disturbances cannot be attributed to. So um, in many ways, this qualifier is more of an exclusionary qualifier where we have to make sure um, that the disturbance is not due to an illicit substance use, some other medication use, or another medical disorder. Looking at some of those traumatic events, we're showing here the lifetime prevalence of those traumas, um, and those are listed across the x-axis, and they are broken down into a general category of trauma. We see things like accidents and some of these um, other trauma of a loved one are fairly pre uh, prevalent in the general population. Um, overall, across the lifetime, um, there's approximately a 70% prevalence of any trauma. And uh, we know that a relatively small proportion of those individuals, something like six or 7%, go on to actually develop PTSD. So even though most of the population does experience some traumatic event throughout their lifetime, relatively few individuals actually end up with a PTSD diagnosis. We know that many of those traumatic events have some pre-trauma risk factors. Um, some of the major ones include gender and sex, age of trauma, um, education, socioeconomic status, and other psychiatric comorbidities. We do know that probably um, one of the most prominent of these pre-trauma risk factors um, is gender. We know that women are four times more likely to develop PTSD when compared to men, uh, when we account for uh, exposure to a traumatic event. And we also know that many of these traumatic events um, you know, produce the same PTSD risk in both men and women. 
including accidents, natural disasters, and sudden death of a loved one. However, things like a sexually assaultive trauma um, have a much different uh, PTSD um, incidence between sex, where we see that uh, even though women are more likely to experience sexual trauma, we see that men are more likely to um, develop PTSD following those sexual traumas. So to summarize here, we have three timeframes that we're primarily interested with PTSD. We have a pre-trauma, a peri-trauma, and a post-trauma timeframe. And we'll talk about all of these sort of um, in concert as we move through the next couple of slides. So we'll be walking through quite a bit of material today and sort of touching on each of these topics individually. I've provided here um, sort of a one-liner for people who are less familiar with this type of study to sort of acclimate themselves and uh, get prepared for what will be shown on each of the slides. If you're familiar with all of these things, you know, feel free to skip over this and move on to some of the, the actual meat. Um, if any of these topics are unfamiliar to you, please feel free to reference the one-liner provided here. We'll start with twin studies. Um, on the left side of the screen here, we see uh, a really nice summary of some of the early twin studies showing that as the female percentage in the twin study increases, the PTSD heritability is, uh, estimate also increases. We'll see this trend kind of following through into our uh, GWAS studies of PTSD as well. On the right side of the screen, we see um, a, a twin study that attempted to sort of separate out the uh, additive genetic component, the shared environmental component, and the non-shared environmental component between some of those traumatic events, including in this case, an assaultive trauma category and a non-assaultive trauma category. We also see that many of these twin studies have identified some uh, comorbid conditions in relation to PTSD. In particular, those sort of highlight um, some other psychiatric diagnoses, we see insomnia pops up quite readily uh, and some other sleep-related disturbance phenotypes that pop up quite readily. In candidate gene studies, one of the first of which was uh, looking at DRD2, that's the dopamine receptor uh, D2, comparing the A1 and A2 um, alleles at DRD2, and there was a significant relationship between the hyperreactivity or hyperarousal uh, PTSD subcluster um, and DRD2 uh, locus. I've also listed some um, additional candidate genes on the bottom left side of the screen. You'll notice some of the sort of favorite psychiatric disorder players here, including COMT, which is the catechol methyl transferase uh, locus. And then we see on the right side of the screen some of the history of those candidate gene studies and where those p-values lie um, in some of those additional studies. So moving into genome-wide association studies, these are, uh, this slide and the next slide is pretty much just an introduction to GWAS before we get into what the, the PTSD data look like. Um, genome-wide association studies are essentially a brute force experiment that is uh, by nature hypothesis generating. Uh, and essentially we are looking at the differences in allele frequency for single nucleotide polymorphisms or single base changes in the DNA between two groups of individuals. In the case for PTSD, we might be looking at a group of individuals who are diagnosed with PTSD versus a group of individuals who are not diagnosed with PTSD. Because we only have two outcomes, this is considered a logistic regression. And this uh, regression model is typically co-varied for uh, a number of confounders in these disease association studies, including age, sex, and some principal components of ancestry, essentially the, the proportion of ancestry assigned to an individual. Um, we also uh, typically co-vary for uh, a technical artifact. In this case, I've listed batch number here. Um, and the example I'm showing here is a logistic regression with two outcomes, although we could also be uh, looking at a continuous or quantitative outcome. Um, and if we're looking at PTSD, this might be something like the total symptom count um, from the PTSD checklist. I'm showing here a number of different uh, uh, Manhattan plots, which is the visual representation of GWAS results. We see uh, a number of different patterns here, but all of them have the same structure. So on the x-axis, we have all of the human autosomes. Those are all of the non-sex chromosomes in humans. On the y-axis, we see the minus log 10 p-value for the association between each data point and our phenotype of interest. Each of those data points represents one of those single nucleotide polymorphisms that I discussed on the previous slide. 
Um, what's important to note here is that depending on how we define our phenotype, we typically will observe a slightly different pattern in our Manhattan plot. So on the left side of the screen, we're looking at a quantitative uh, versus a binary definition of PTSD. On the right side of the screen, we're looking at stratifying our PTSD data by males and females in separate studies. And we'll see that each of those um, uh, patterns of our Manhattan plots look slightly different depending on how we've defined the phenotype. On this slide, we're showing how um, that whole pattern of SNPs or that whole pattern of genetic architecture overlaps with other phenotypes. On the left side of the screen, we see that PTSD uh, shares genetic risk with uh, anthropometric traits, some behavioral phenotypes, some cognitive phenotypes, uh, and certainly some psychiatric disorder phenotypes. On the right side of the screen, we're not necessarily looking anymore at what PTSD is and is not associated with on a genetic perspective, but now we're looking at how does PTSD compare to some other disorders. So PTSD, for example, is associated with um, a number of anthropometric phenotypes. But when we look at the major depression category on the, the far right side of the screen, we see that major depression has some genetic correlates that are not observed when we look at the PTSD category. And those typically uh, align with the uh, anthropometric traits, at least in this figure. So one of the major uh, pitfalls to uh, the current status of genetic studies is that there is this overwhelming representation of European ancestry in our genetic studies. And this means that most of our findings are generally only applicable to uh, other individuals of European ancestry. And as you can imagine, this uh, puts a, a considerable um, hindrance on applying any of this information to uh, a clinical practice. So to sort of mitigate that downfall or that pitfall of the field, um, the PTSD genetic research community has really made a push towards understanding how genetic risk for PTSD exists in individuals of admix ancestry. And this is done by using um, a method that essentially paints your chromosomes. And we can see that on the bottom left side of the screen where we have red and blue that indicates a uh, different part of the chromosomes that are of different ancestries. And then we can perform our genome-wide association studies using this information in our model. So next we'll be talking about gene by environment interactions. Um, because PTSD relies so heavily on the uh, presence of some index trauma, it's extremely important to consider um, how different environments interact with risk for PTSD. However, no large study to date actually looks at PTSD as the outcome in terms of gene by environment interaction. There are a number of different studies, however, that look at PTSD or, or related traumas and pre-trauma risk factors as environments. Um, and one of these will be presented by me on Tuesday, so please feel free um, to tune in for that between 2.15 and 3.45. Next, we'll look at epigenetics and transcriptomics. Um, this is really important because we can actually get relatively um, strong effect estimates using uh, uh, slightly smaller sample sizes. This is because um, these epigenetic and transcriptomic changes can be directly related to either causal mechanisms or downstream consequences of the phenotype of interest. Looking at epigenetics, we see that PTSD uh, is associated with a number of genes that share uh, risk with some other psychiatric disorders, and that's shown in the top right from Smith et al. We also see that um, some of those PTSD subdomains, in this case avoidance symptoms, are positively correlated with accelerated DNA methylation age. In terms of transcriptomics, we have uh, two types of information shown here. On the left side of the screen, we're showing uh, peripheral tissue, in this case it's blood, and on the right side of the screen we're showing some of these gene expression changes using uh, brain tissue. And both of these studies, um, and sort of this transcriptomics of PTSD in general, converge on this concept of a dysregulated immune, uh, uh, inflammatory response uh, in PTSD. And this is really important because it's much easier to study um, a minimally invasive tissue like blood than it is to study brain tissue. So if we can find things that overlap between those two tissues, we can make some more uh, translatable findings uh, that are hopefully more meaningful and applicable to um, individuals with PTSD. Finally, looking at neuroimaging, 
Um, we see two examples here on the left and right side of the screen where we identify hippocampal markers of current PTSD and some of its genetic correlates. And this is a really nice study because it breaks down PTSD into civilian cohorts, military cohorts, and then by sex as well. And we know that some of these things are hypervariable between, between risk factor, right? Especially the male and female um, dichotomy in some of these pre-trauma risk factors. On the right side of the screen, we see an association between the putamen volume and PTSD and anxiety disorders. And this is really nice because we're able to see brain regions that sort of uh, confer risk for not only PTSD, but a number of other correlated phenotypes. So to conclude, molecular studies of PTSD and its symptom clusters reveal an extremely complex architecture that overlaps with psychopathology, um, and neurodevelopmental disorders, as well as some psychiatric phenotypes. But also what we're finding is that there's a number of peripheral disorders and even non-disease phenotypes that overlap with PTSD. We see this quite readily with anthropometric phenotypes. We also know that um, sex, ancestry, and trauma type specific risks are uh, abundant across all of these molecular investigations. And we know that this induces some level, some level of heterogeneity on top of the uh, diagnostic complexity that exists for PTSD already. Sample sizes are increasingly uh, growing and this is happening quite rapidly. And this will make our studies uh, much more robust and in particular allows us to start stratifying the epigenetic, transcriptomic and neuroimaging studies to make inferences and conclusions about um, specific types of changes in those heterogeneous cohorts that make up our PTSD cases. Finally, given the stigma associated with some trauma types, it is imperative that both researchers and clinicians engage with both high-risk communities and general communities to begin reducing stigma and improve PTSD scientific literacy and advocacy. And with that, I will um, provide thank yous um, to Karisten and Caroline and Gita for their critical feedback, as well as the PGC and the MVP and the WCPG organizing committee. Um, and the contributors of this uh, work are myself, as well as Renato Polamonti. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. Hello, my name is Adam Mayhofer. Today I'm presenting an update on the analysis of the PGC PTSD group. Our last analysis was of our FREEZE 2 data. This included approximately 200,000 subjects. It identified multiple genome-wide significant loci. Moreover, a polygenic risk score generated from this data uh, was highly significantly predictive of PTSD in an outside sample. PTSD is frequently assessed as a quantitative symptom. Um, in about 90% of our sample, we have PTSD measured as a quantitative trait. Uh, in addition, we also have measurements of self-reported trauma exposure. This is important because there's potential gain in power by utilizing a quantitative score as opposed to a case control criteria. In particular, as the figures show, we see these effects uh, most greatly in population studies. Our GWAS of quantitative symptom scores identified five genome-wide significant loci. Two of these had direct replication in MVP. Uh, two others had at least nominal evidence of replication. We performed a GWAS of self-reported trauma exposure in the UK Biobank sample that included approximately 130,000 subjects. Uh, trauma exposure was a measure of eight different trauma types. Um, we found that it was heritable. Uh, SNP-based heritability was approximately 7%, so comparable to PTSD. And there was a significant genetic correlation with PTSD. The RG was 0.6. And so we performed an analysis of PTSD and trauma using MTAG. Um, in doing this analysis, we identified eight genome-wide significant loci. Uh, four of these were identified in the initial GWAS of PTSD, and there were an additional four of which uh, two replicated in MVP. Uh, one of them, an intergenic hit on chromosome two, in fact replicated a genome-wide significance in MVP. And so I'm going to present the results of our FREEZE 2.5 GWAS. This includes what I've just shown, as well as the MVP re-experiencing symptoms GWAS. Uh, in total, we have about 330,000 subjects. Um, our upcoming Freeze 3, uh, we anticipate about 500,000 individuals. Uh, that will incorporate EHR data, additional genotypes, 
summary data provided to us from other sites, um, an increase in samples from MVP, as well as non-European ancestry subjects. And so in our freeze 2.5, we have identified 21 genome-wide significant loci um, and strong evidence of enrichment of PTSD genes in different brain regions. Um, for our significant loci, we found that eight of them were reported as significant in MVP alone. Um, so that gives us 13 newly identified loci. Uh, some of them, while new to PTSD, have been previously implicated in psychiatric disorders. So compared to case control diagnosis from PTSD, incorporating symptom scores resulted in an increase in power. Moreover, multivariate analysis that incorporated trauma exposure uh, de facto resulted in an increase in the sample size or the effective sample size. We plan to continue with this strategy uh, for our upcoming Freeze 3, which we hope to have completed in spring of next year. So I'd like to thank you for attending this talk, and I'd like to take a second to acknowledge our many contributors. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Atkinson. I'm an instructor in the Analytic and Translational Genetics Unit at Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm excited to tell you today about a method I've been developing that lets you include admixed individuals in genome-wide association studies in a well-calibrated manner. To start off, the vast majority, almost 80% of GWAS, are conducted on European descent cohorts. Only a few percent of all GWAS include individuals of admixed ancestry, despite these groups making up more than a third of the US populace. This issue is what prompted us to want to develop a method that could allow us to include such populations in a well-calibrated genome-wide association study, either alone or alongside homogeneous cohorts. So the way that admix groups are currently handled is generally by using principal components analysis. So on the slide here, I'm showing the PC plot for the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium PTSD Working Group. And often the first step in large scale collection efforts is to define who is homogeneous enough to include in a GWAS. So we'll generally draw a circle around people um, homogeneous enough to include and exclude everybody else. And this in general um, will include the European descent individuals as they uh, most often represent kind of the bulk of the samples. Admixed individuals specifically are discarded um, usually due to concerns over population structure as if there is population structure, this can bias your results by resulting in false positive associations. So the way that we handle this issue is by incorporating local ancestry. So local ancestry tells us the ancestral origin of each particular haplotype tract in an admixed individual at each spot in the genome. So in this example, three-way admixed individual, the y-axis represents the autosomes, the position along them is shown on the x-axis, and because we are diploid, the top and bottom half of each chromosome are painted differently. So each tract in this individual is color coded according to the ancestry from which it derived. And each person in the cohort will have a unique fine scale um, pattern of local ancestry. So the intuition behind Tractor is that to correct for population structure and admixed people, we effectively scoop out the tracts for each component ancestry. So we literally do this by outputting new VCF files with other ancestries blanked out as missing data, but also um, in the sense that we output ancestry dosage files, which will track the ancestry context of each of the alleles in each person at each spot in their genome. I've also built a couple additional features into Tractor that I won't have time to touch upon here, such as using local ancestry to correct for long range phase errors in admix cohorts. So the statistical model that we've built into Tractor tests each SNP for an association with the phenotype by splitting up the ancestry context of the minor alleles. So in the two-way admixed example, we include terms for how many copies of the insect index ancestry there are for this person at this spot in the genome, as well as how many minor alleles are falling on the first ancestry backbone and the second ancestry backbone. So this is what corrects for the fine scale population structure. If there are differing allele frequencies for the ancestries at that position, 
they won't be confounded as we'll have deconvolved them. This model can also scale to an arbitrary number of ancestries and allows for the ready inclusion of all of your necessary covariates. To evaluate Tractor's power to discover GWAS loci, we ran sets of simulations varying the parameters of the effect size difference across ancestries, overall effect size, minor low frequency, overall, and difference across ancestries, admixture fractions, and disease prevalence. I'm just showing four of the major um, models used in the paper here. In all of the different panels, um, the dashed line is our tractor model, and the solid line is our standard GWAS model, both involving 10 principal components. You'll notice that the tractor model often has um, boosted GWAS power, meaning we would have the power to find loci that would have been missed in this admixed cohort using standard GWAS procedures. This power boost is the most dramatic when there's a large effect size difference across ancestries, as shown in panel D. This is the case when there's an effect only in one ancestry on the European tracts in this two-way admixed African-European cohort. Notably, when referring to effect size, I mean both to the case of when there is a difference in the true causal effect across ancestries, as well as when there's a marginal effect difference across ancestries. So this perceived marginal effect size of a tag SNP might be different across the groups depending on the minor allele frequencies and the LD pattern that's resulted from that population's demographic history. So this means we should expect to get gains in GWAS power at a large number of variable positions across the genome. Additionally, in cases when we would not expect any value from incorporating local ancestry, that is when everything is identical across ancestries, we do take a small hit in power from the inclusion of an additional term in our model, but this hit is not too substantial. Finally, the last thing we wanted to confirm in our simulations was that Tractor not only added power to GWAS to discover real loci, but also was able to produce accurate ancestry-specific effect sizes. And indeed, for every genetic model we tested, it produced highly accurate ancestry-specific effect sizes. So to close up, I'll remind you of the primary deliverables of Tractor. First, I've developed a readily implementable, implementable analytic framework that allows for the well-calibrated inclusion of admix people in large-scale collections. So you no longer need to toss out all your admix folks. You can include them um, either in a well-calibrated GWAS in your admix cohort alone or in a large-scale study with your homogeneous collections. We've also added an optional step to recover long-range tracts that are disrupted by phasing errors. With respect to GWAS, our novel local ancestry aware GWAS model can improve your results in a variety of ways, most notably through boosting GWAS power, um, also through generating ancestry specific effect size estimates, as well as helping to localize GWAS signal to be more close to the causal variance. So in sum, this framework should dramatically improve the existing methodologies for studying admix individuals and allow for a significantly better calibrated um, understanding of the genetics of complex psychiatric disorders um, in underrepresented populations. So with that, um, I would like to thank you very much for your interest. And if you'd like further details about our method, including assessing its performance on empirical data, please read our preprint, which is currently available on BioArchive. Thanks very much. Hello, I'm Raj Moray. I'll be talking about the genetic basis of race. Race is a social construct. I'll also cover geographic populations and ancestry as they relate to genetics and uh, racial groups as they relate to genetics, human migrations, and the fallacy of race genetics. There's several racial, uh, racial categorizations used on the most common Afri African, European, Asian, Oceanic, Native American use by 23andMe, the U.S. Census uses its own, which has changed over time. Race features are basically just surface traits, um, skin color, eye color, et cetera. These are influenced by climate and other environmental factors. All surface traits um, are these apparent, uh, visually apparent phenotypes with minute genetic differences. And for the most part, um, these traits vary continuously by geography. As you can see, skin color changing over geography, and this corresponds uh, very closely to the amount of UV exposure. There's many historical 
categorizations of race uh, sometimes have been used also to just attribute to behaviors and to create a social hierarchy and uh, sometimes have used science to defend them. Um, here you see in Myanmar, for example, eight different races and each country has uh, a different construct. These ba are based on social forces, but scientifically or genetically, we wanna look at clients or ancestry. As you can see, the different um, uh, populations in Asia. It's also important to look at um, migration. So the first modern humans left Africa 70,000 years ago, preceded by Neanderthals and Denisovans, but we'll focus on the modern humans. Um, these recent or, uh, migrant people migrating were uh, from present day Tanzania. Uh, you can see the Hadza uh, man here. Genetics um, can be used to trace this kind of migration out of Africa uh, from 200,000 years ago, going into other parts of Africa, 100,000 years ago in Arabian Peninsula, 70,000 years ago to India. Skin color is an important uh, attribute used to describe race, um, the social construct of race. It's one mutation that's different between Europeans and Africans. Uh, out of 20,000 base pairs, there's a G in Africans and an A in Europeans. This showed up about 8,000 years ago. And it's interesting that these cave paintings um, in, from France uh, were then painted by brown people rather than white people. The deepest genetic splits in the human family are not between races like whites or blacks. The deepest divides are actually between different populations in Africa like Hassan in Western Cape and Turkana in Kenya and the Pygmies in Southern Africa. These groups spent thousands, tens of thousands of years even before leaving Africa, uh, before Africans left, uh, which was about Mm, 300,000 years ago was when modern humans evolved and they spent the first 230,000 years in Africa. And here you can see the genetic diversity within Africa and other parts of the world. So more genetic diversity, say from Southern Africa to East Africa, then from East Africa to Europe. So in conclusion, racial groups are genetically heterogeneous in Latin clear-cut genetic boundaries. Um, so there's more difference between different um, African groups than there is between Africans and Europeans. Um, the genetic differences uh, in race are trivial. Um, really, we wanna look at the concept of ancestry or uh, populations to study genetics and, and, um, and biology. So race is a social, political, and cultural construct construct and not a genetic construct. Thank you. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you might be viewing from. My name is Seth Disner, and today I'll be presenting on our ongoing efforts to leverage the PGC PTSD Consortium to better understand the genetic underpinnings of traumatic brain injury, or TBI. Now, these two disorders both stem from trauma exposure are both highly comorbid, particularly in military and veteran populations, which has led them to be dubbed the signature injuries of the recent combat engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan. But they're not only comorbid, rather they seem to share an underlying mechanism, vulnerability, evidenced by the nearly three times higher rate of PTSD that's found in individuals who have been diagnosed with mild TBI or concussion in the past. Part of that close association may be linked to the convergent symptoms that are seen in PTSD and post-concussion syndrome, or PCS for short, which is a disorder that applies to the so-called miserable minority group who experience mild TBI symptoms for longer than the expected three-month time frame. And many of these persistent symptoms, as you can see in the figure here, overlap prominently with PTSD. Now, although the trauma-related disorders are closely linked, the amount known about their genetic associations is actually quite different. And for PTSD, as you likely know, if only based on recent talks, the PGC PTSD last year released the largest to date PTSD GWAS results using over 205,000 individuals to identify six novel risk loci. Uh, but for mild TBI, the genetic research is not nearly as far along. Although the literature is expanding, the vast majority of work so far.
that remains focused on candidate genes, such as the apple with the motor polymorphism and the BDNF met met genotype, which have each been linked to TBI incidence in a systematic review. Other candidates touch on multifactorial roles, including inflammatory cytokines, neurotrophins, and other mechanisms linked to brain health. The few polygenic approaches to TBI that have been done so far do show some promise with polygenic risk scores predicting TBI sequela, but samples have been moderate in size, generally under 1,000 individuals. So the close link between these disorders, but the large gap in research to date on their genetic underpinnings, prompted us to look at the overlap in these genotypes, leading to the formation of the TBI work group in PGC PTSD. Since many PGC PTSD studies focused primarily on trauma outcomes, many also assessed the TBI phenotypes as part of their data collection. And as you can see here, the cohorts involved in the work group together have assessed for TBI in over 34,000 individuals in county, with the majority reflecting active duty or veteran samples. Harmonization is currently underway to account for the variability in TBI assessment measures, which is ample, but we're seeking new samples and collaborations as we approach our first data freeze in the coming months. Once the freeze is complete, we aim to execute several primary analyses, including what would be the largest to date GWAS of TBI and TBI related outcomes. We can also power a large scale set of PRS analyses designed to identify shared heritability of PTSD or related phenotypes. And we can also derive multiple TBI related phenotypes, such as, for example, the number of TBI injuries, the duration of TBI symptoms like loss of consciousness, the type of injury, whether it was blast or impact or related to that which would allow us to hone in on which phenotypes may have the most robust link to PTSD. In the future, we also plan on disseminating the TBI phenotype to the PGC PTSD consortium more broadly uh, for use uh, in a variety of domains, uh, including potentially as a covariate in PTSD analyses, or as an environmental proxy for G by E analyses predicting PTSD. And we also plan on making the TBI variable phenotype uh, broadly available for other work groups, such as the neuroimaging group, physical health group, uh, epigenetics group, for example, to advance our understanding of the close link between PTSD and TBI using those other mechanisms as well. So with all that said, I want to thank you for your time. And of course, thank you for the many collaborators who contributed to this effort. It's very much ongoing. Uh, if you have any questions or if you're interested in potentially getting involved, contributing uh, information about your studies, your data, or secondary data analyses, please feel free to get in touch with me here at this email, gisne 14 at umf.edu uh, is the best address, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Greetings. I'm Adam Mayhofer on behalf of the PGC PTSD. Today I'm going to give an update on rare copy number variation as it pertains to post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is, of course, a condition that develops as a consequence of traumatic stress. It, its symptoms involve intrusive memories, avoidant behaviors, negative changes in thinking, and hyperarousal. It has numerous other comorbidities. Copy number variation is where numbers of copies of a gene region vary from one individual to the next. They can be inherited or develop within individuals. They can include duplications or deletions. The figure on the right actually shows duplications. Uh, they are well documented uh, to be associated with autism and schizophrenia and with growing evidence of association with other psychiatric disorders. CNV data are called using array technology typically uh, using raw intensity values. Uh, these values are available for most studies within the PGC PTSD and they are called using hidden Markov models for programs such as Penn CNV and iPattern. Uh, we followed the PGC CNV pipeline to call CNV in these samples with just a couple of deviations. And we focused our analysis on subjects of European ancestry who passed GWAS QC otherwise and were unrelated. This gave us a sample of 150,000 subjects with PTSD phenotyping and CNV data. We filtered CNVs down to CNVs that were greater than 20 kilobases in length and were present in less than 1% of the population. And we analyzed every batch of genotype data separately, and we combined them using inverse variance weighted meta-analysis. Our model was simple. It was PTSD symptoms, as predicted by CNV, five principal components, and the quality metrics generated by the CNV programs to adjust for potential confounding. 
And so the analysis that I'm going to show you today looks at the overall burden across the genome of CNV as it relates to PTSD. And what we found is that this overall CNV burden is related to PTSD symptoms. Uh, we found that for every megabase of CNV, PTSD symptoms would increase by 0 0.1 points on a 100-point scale. Uh, most of this was being driven by the UK Biobank sample, which is not a surprise because it's approximately 80% of the data included in the set that I'm showing you. And when we stratified deletions and duplications, we found that for deletions, the estimate of effect on PTSD was not significantly different from zero, and for duplications, it was a 0 0.2 point increase for every uh, megabase burden of CNV. Uh, so this overall burden seemed to be driven by duplications. There are many CNVs known to be implicated with other psychiatric disorders. We filtered down to this list of CNVs uh, and tested their burden association with PTSD. We found that for every megabase of deletions in these regions, there was a 2.7 point increase in PTSD symptoms. And for every megabase of duplications over these regions, there was a 0.7 point increase in PTSD symptoms. Uh, for this duplication analysis, we also uh, looked at the overall burden of duplications with these regions removed and found that the overall burden of duplications was still significant. So to summarize an analysis of CNV in 150,000 subjects, identified that the overall burden of duplications was associated with PTSD. Looking at previously implicated regions, we found that deletions and duplications of these regions were associated with PTSD. And in the future, we're going to examine CNV at higher levels of resolution, including gene pathways, genes, and specific breakpoints on genes. We're going to incorporate data from other ancestries and add more data in general. Uh, we hope to identify novel CNV associated with PTSD. And so I'd like to thank you for listening today. Goodbye. Hi, my name is Raj Moray. I'll be talking about the genetic architecture of structural covariance networks. Structural covariance networks have received a great deal of attention in recent years. Um, they show essentially the interregional relationships between brain regions, typically cortical thickness and surface area. You can get them by thresholding the correlation matrix and they've been studied in a wide, wide range of disorders. We don't know the exact significance of them. They seem to resemble intrinsic functional connectivity as well as white matter connectivity. They do undergo um, uh, change during neurodevelopment and maturation. And, um, and we actually know very little about the genetic forces that uh, model structural covariance networks. Most of these, in fact, all of these are done based on twin-based heritability which is very different than SNP-based heritability. The latter always is, tends to underestimate the heritability uh, because it has a low power in detecting uh, rare variants and doesn't model the complex ways in which variants interact. Um, and we also know cortical thickness surface area are very complex, very polygenic phenotypes. And so we um, use the Enigma 3 data set um, with about 50,000 uh, samples to look at the coupling between genetic correlation and phenotypic correlation to look at how um, this coupling varies um, in net different networks of the brain and how it is modulated by Euclidean distance. <clears throat> so in terms of Jeff definitions, uh, genetic correlation is the proportion of variance that two traits are due to genetic causes. Zero means they're independent traits. One means that they are completely uh, identical traits. And phenotypic correlation, similarly, two traits uh, have high genetic correlation when they move up and down together. Um, and so we map the genetic and phenotypic correlation. We see that here on the left for cortical thickness and on the right for surface area. And when we look at the relationship, the coupling between phenotypic and genotypic, you see on the left for cortical thickness that there's regions like the orbitofrontal and superior parietal that are highly um, coupled. And then for surface area, many more regions, including inferior parietal and superior temporal sulcus and so forth. Then we looked at whether Euclidean distance has a role and we see that um, genotypic coupling uh, it is correlated to um, cortical thickness, 
Uh, phenotypic is also related to cortical thickness. And um, we can also look at surface area, which is on the right hand side. Both of them um, have a, a linear and a nonlinear component. And so we looked at the relationship, including the dist Euclidean distance in the regression model, and we see much stronger um, uh, coupling there in this uh, for cortical thickness with uh, regions in the inferior frontal and uh, superior parietal, and the surface area looks actually very similar to what we had before. And um, these are the uh, findings here on the left, looking at the phenotypic genotypic coupling. Uh, but here then on the right hand side, right hand half, we regressed out distance and distance squared, and we can actually see that this makes quite a bit of difference. But with surface area, we still see fairly strong coupling. These are the, the red blobs, inferior parietal and the lateral uh, occipital gyrus. Um, and so this is um, very interesting, we think. And thank you for, um, for sh sh listening to this presentation. Hi, this is Clement Zai from the Center for Addiction and Mental Health at the University of Toronto in Canada. I'll be presenting some data on post-traumatic stress disorder in a Canadian population sample. Twin studies have supported a genetic component in PTSD with heritability estimates between 23% and 71%. And there have been a few candidate genes and early GWAS hits. However, these findings have not been replicated or among the top findings in more recent larger GWASs, such as the PGC PTSD Freeze 1 GWAS on over 20,000 individuals. And this suggests that PTSD is highly polygenic with many genetic variants, each contributing a small proportion of the risk to PTSD. And more recently, in 2019, PGC PTSD followed up with a Freeze 2 GWAS on over 200,000 individuals, where they reported a few uh, significant hits as well as some genetic correlations. And some of these correlations were also reported in the Million Veterans Program GWAS on re-experiencing symptoms. And these uh, genetic correlations include depressive symptoms, schizophrenia, neuroticism, smoking, insomnia, and educational attainment. And and hopefully with larger GWAS sample sizes, there will be more uh, genome-wide significant hits that are also replicable. And, and one sample that could actually help in that effort is the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or CLSA for short. And it's a longitudinal study on individuals 45 to 85 years of age who are followed for 20 years at three-year intervals. And this study includes two arms, the tracking arm, which consists of 20,000 individuals using computer-assisted telephone interviews on course measures, including lifestyle, behaviors, social, physical, clinical, psychological, health, and healthcare use variables. And there's also the comprehensive arm of 30,000 individuals using computer-assisted personal interviews on also the core variables as well as other variables such as diet, medication use, chronic disease symptoms, sleep, etc. And they were also asked to provide blood and urine samples for biomarker analysis, including DNA analysis. And one of the assessments uh, in the comprehensive arm includes the primary care post-traumatic stress disorder screen scale, in which they were asked, in your life, have you ever had any experience that was so frightening horrible or upsetting that in the past month you felt numb or detached, were constantly on guard, had nightmares on wanted thoughts, or avoided situations that reminded you of the horrible situations. And on the right is the distribution of the yes responses among the respondents, as shown um, the nightmares and unwanted thoughts seem to be more highly represented among the four items. The assessment also includes veteran status and uh, in which 10%, around 10% of the sample reported being veterans. And veteran status we found was not uh, significantly associated with the positive PTSD screen in our preliminary analysis. And uh, earlier we mentioned uh, DNA analysis. Um, 
So 19,669 individuals were genotyped on the FMetrix X Yom array. And as shown on the population structure plot on the right, um, most of the individuals are considered European ancestry, as shown in this uh, graph. And we performed a preliminary uh, PTSD GWAS in the CLSA, um, and including the first four principal components as uh, covariates. And we, we did not find genome-wide significant hits in the sample as expected based on the sample size of 16,494. Um, but we'll be following up with um, extracting uh, the whole genome imputation data and also adding covariates uh, such as age and sex. And we'll also look into genes, pathways, and polygenic risk scores, and also uh, looking at uh, related phenotypes as well. And here are the acknowledgments the Tannenbaum Center for Pharmacogenetics and the uh, co-investigators and the specialized computing cluster at ChemH, as well as the CLSA investigators and funding sources. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone, I am Antonella De Lillo and, I'm, and uh, I am a research affiliate uh, at Polymanti Lab, Division of Human Genetics, Department of Psychiatry, Yale University School of Medicine. Uh, today, I, and today I will speak about uh, uh, phenome-wide association studies. So, as you can see in this figure, uh, FIBOS uh, may be considered one alternative and or complementary approach to genome-wide association studies with a reverse perspective. Whereas a GWOS uses a phenotype to genotype approach beginning with a specific phenotype that is associated with genetic variants across the genome, human genome, a FIWOS uses a uh, genotype to phenotype approach to test for association over a wide range of human phenotypic traits, or the phenome. An example of application uh, of uh, FIVOS in post-traumatic stress disorder is shown by Stein and Tal uh, and colleagues that, um, that to identify putative cross-phenotype association uh, tested loci associated with a total index of recent uh, PTSD symptom severity in more than 200,000 million veteran program participants with respect to more than 300,000 uh, traits uh, derived, derived from uh, the BA electronic health records. After applying uh, a, a phenome-wide multiple testing uh, uh, correction, they identify a, a pleiotropic effect for four significant variants associated with anxiety, phobic and dissociative, dissociative disorders, mood and tobacco use disorders, hypothyroidism and kidney stones, and finally chronic airway obstruction respectively. In addition to uh, MVP uh, data sources, as you can see in this slide, uh, we can use a wide range of uh, database to perform pre-woos, um, like 23andMe, FinGen Project, MVP, Allovas, UK Biobank, TopMed, and the Emerge Network. Uh, for example, UK Biobank, and uh, enrolled more than 500,000 participants uh, collecting information about, so to, so, for example, social demographic and life, lifestyle factors, brain and heart imaging, um, electronic health, health records data, and um, etc. On the other hand, uh, all of us, uh, research program is working to improve healthcare through research, building a diverse database that can inform thousands of studies on several health conditions involving one million of people. So, uh, in summary, um, FIBOS 
uh, are a powerful tool to expand knowledge uh, about genotype phenotype association, identify cross phenotype and ancestry specific genetic associations, and conduct studies useful, useful to identify association among different clinical uh, traits. However, uh, several challenges remain, such as developing algorithms to extract phenotypes uh, from uh, electronic health records and um, developing more robust methods for addressing the multiple testing burdens that controls type uh, 1 and type 2 error rates in FIWOS, and finally understanding the clinical relationship of cross phenotype association and on the other hand the biological and functional implication of the variant tested. So, thank you for your attention and uh, please feel free to contact me if uh, you have uh, any questions. Hi everybody, my name is Claudio De Angelis from the Polymanti Lab in the Division of Human Genetics of the Department of Psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine. And I would introduce you to the concept of polygenic risk scoring. Everybody knows that uh, the current common genetic testing aims to identify the mutation related to disease or trait. However, if it could be potentially easy for monogenic traits, we know that the common phenotypic ones and disease tend to be extremely polygenic, and the phenotypic display depends on several scattering mutations across the genome. Today, the genomic technologies allow us to obtain sequencing data for whole genome, boosting the, the capability to compare the genomes of people with or without a trait, even lacking the knowledge of specific gene target. The polygenic risk score is founded upon this information and tell us how the collection of variants found for people can impact the risk for the onset of a certain trait. In other words, we can define a PRS as a single value estimating the individual genetic liability to a phenotype. And this score is computed as the sum of the genome-wide effect sites for the variant that are derived from GWAS data. Accordingly, PRS analysis is characterized by two key input data sets. The first one is a GWAS from which we can obtain the summary statistics providing the effect size and the p-value for each genetic variant. The second element is the target data set, providing individual genotype and phenotype data. Both the data sets require a quality control step that could be related, among others, to the checking of SNP heritability in the GWAS, to the accounting for relatedness and subtle population structure in the target data set. So following the CUSI step, we can proceed in generating the PRS. Several methods could be leveraged for this, accounting for linkage disequilibrium-based clamping rather than the inclusion of all the SNPs, using a different shrinking method, and calculating the PRS at multiple p-values threshold. Furthermore, the PRS obtained could be used to evaluate the shared genetic liability between trades. And finally, the PRS obtained could be leveraged for testing in data that other than the base or target sets. Thus, if PRS is calculated for multiple individuals, their score will follow a normal distribution, and some people will fall in the middle, while others will be at the edge of this distribution, suggesting their low or high risk to develop the trait. This approach has been used by the PGC PTSD group in 2019 for assessing the predictive values of PRS for PTSD using UK Biobank as training sample. The analysis showed a highly significant increase in the odds to develop, to develop PTSD across the PRS quantiles in European sample, excluding UKB, as you can follow as PGC 1.5 in the left panel. The analysis with Team UK Biobank 
shows even stronger PRS predictability with the highest odds ratio for UKB men with a PRS trained on UKB women. And moreover, the PRS generated through the European sample, including UKB, and you can refer to PGC2 in the right panel, was tested in the external million veteran program replication cohort using experiencing symptoms as target for the prediction, showing a highly significant increase per PRS quantile. Finally, I will spend a few words for a novel approach we are implementing that uh, relates to the application of PRS in Asian genomic landscape to investigate the traumatic stress genetic liability. Indeed, the biological data recovered through the analysis of the human skeleton could act as a, a time capsule for identifying stressful life experience. So leveraging this data in the context of the polygenic inheritance, we plan to investigate the molecular mechanism involved in the sensitivity to traumatic stress in ancient population, highlighting a novel aspect for data evaluation and contributing to the knowledge of the human relationship with stress factors. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, I'm Dora Koller from Renato Polimantis Lab, one of the Division of Human Genetics at the Department of Psychiatry of Yale University School of Medicine. And today I'm going to talk about the fundamentals of clinical trial de design. So first I'm going to start with a new overview of clinical trial process. So first of all, uh, we start with preclinical studies which are conducted in the laboratory. They, are, they last for several years, sometimes even 10 years. And uh, we do it in cells and then later in animals. Then after the drug is approved for human testing, uh, we start with the phase one clinical trials where we test the safety, the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of the drug. It lasts for one or two years and it's conducted in 20 to 80 healthy volunteers. Then it's followed by the phase two clinical trials where we test the safety, the efficacy, pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of the drug. It lasts for one or two years in 100 to 300 patients. Then it's followed by the phase three clinical trials where it has the safety, the efficacy, and the dosing of the drug. It lasts for two to four years in 1,000 to 3,000 patients. Then after the FDA review and approval, we still don't finish the clinical trial process it's obligatory to perform phase four clinical trials for the long-term efficacy and side effects and the cost effectiveness. And the whole process takes up to 15 years, but special designations can speed up the process. For example, it is here in 2020, there are many clinical trials uh, for COVID-19 treatment. So these kind of uh, trials are much faster and the review and an approval process is much shorter than usually. It's very important to always follow the consort guidelines when we want to report a trial, which is basically the consolidated standards of reporting trials. So here you can see the flow diagram, which we always have to uh, fill when we finish a clinical trial. So we basically, we have to report all the patients or the subjects because they can be also healthy volunteers who were selected for these clinical trials. So we have to always, uh, always show which patients were excluded because of not meeting the inclusion criteria or declined to participate or for other reasons. And then later on, many uh, volunteers or patients don't, do not finish the trials. So then we also have to always uh, show which patients didn't finish the trial and for what reasons. And then we also have to complete a checklist, which is basically writing another protocol after finishing the trial, which can be actually a research paper as well. And here we always have to uh, show the type of trial in the title and abstract. And we also have to introduce this type of trial we showed in the title. Then we have 
have to explain the method. So basically the trial design, the participants, interventions, outcomes, a sample size, randomization, and statistical methods. Then we have to show the results, of course. Then we have to discuss the limitations and we have to interpret our results. And then we also have to register the trial. It's also very important to register it in a clinical trial registration site. Then we have to also send the protocol, the original protocol we used before studying the trial, and then the funding. So clinical trials are changing nowadays in the era of personalized medicine. So basically, what traditional medicine states that the same treatment should be, uh, should be administered for a specific disease. So each individual who have that disease. But precision medicine uh, changed these uh, kind of ideas. So now the goal is to uh, have different groups of patients and each group should receive uh, some treatment in some dosing and the other group should receive another treatment or a different dosing based on some biomarkers, for example, uh, specific for these individuals in the group, which biomarkers can be uh, genetic polymorphisms, for example. Uh, clinical trials in psychiatry are very difficult. Anyways, clinical trials are very difficult to perform than to finish than to report, that, but in psychiatry it's even worse. First of all, because of the overlap between psychiatric disorders. So basically many times the symptoms are very similar and the same drugs are used for uh, different kind of diseases, what you can hear, see here in this figure as well. And there are some serious ethical issues. What does it mean? Like, for example, a patient is hospitalized and cannot really agree on uh, participating in the trial. So what do we do in this uh, case? Then uh, usually the psychiatric diseases are on a spectrum. So the treatment might be only effective for some of the patients, but not all of them, which I mentioned before. Also, it's really difficult to decide what should be the control uh, group. Should, they, should it be placebo? Usually the best solution is to compare two different psychiatric, uh, psychiatric drugs. Then there, is, there are problems with continued engagement and follow-up process because many patients don't, do not finish the trial. And then it is also difficult to introduce the results to the clinical practice. So the goal here is uh, personalized medicine again. So each individual should receive a sp uh, or, uh, individual treatment. I also wanted to talk a little bit about PTSD. Uh, which are the current treatment options. So basically the drugs which are used for PTSD are mostly antidepressants. So they are not uh, actually available specifically for PTSD. They are for uh, depression, depression. So there is no drug available for PTSD for now. There are some ongoing trials with different drugs, but these drugs are also repurposed drugs. So they were actually, uh, they are used already in other diseases. So it's very important now to actually find a drug which is specific for PTSD because actually antidepressants sometimes work, but they are less helpful than other type of uh, treatment options. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, please, if you have some uh, questions, uh, you can ask me after this presentation or, or whenever you want. Thank you.